Welcome everybody. This is Shecky from High Return Real Estate and we've got a really, really awesome show today, a little bit unusual format. But the title is How to Go from Two to 73 Properties in Just One Year. And so the, the gentleman that has done this uh, is a guy I happen to know very, very well. And I'm going to bring him on here in just a moment. So Stand by, we'll be right with you. Welcome to the High Return Real Estate Show, the podcast for heavy hitters. Two men, one mission. It's time to build your empire. Okay, welcome everybody. As I alluded to, we have a very, very special guest today. And many of our regular, regular listeners will know exactly who it is because it's actually my good friend and business partner, Mr. Jack Gibson. Welcome, Jack. Thank you, Shecky. What an honor to be a guest on this podcast with you. <laughs> I know. It's great. I'm really excited about what we're going to do today. But um, I, I want to just, you know, thank you in advance because um, as we had sort of discussed previously, you know, I'm going to kind of interrogate you a little bit. But, you know, you've just done some really, really amazing things, nothing short of of inspirational from a standpoint of, you know, what's just happened for you really in the last, you know, 12 months or so. And um, I'm very, very excited to find out, as I'm sure our listeners are, what really happened. So could you just kind of take us through the last 12 months? Like, I know you went, you know, you started with two properties, uh, but what really has happened for you over the last year or so? It's, it's a great question and first off I just want to you know convey to the listeners that you know you don't have to be successful in real estate to go from two to 73 in one year it's <laughs> um, th there's certainly a, a lot that goes behind that and a lot of planning that I've done over the past several years leading up to this time you know that's created that kind of success so a lot of times you know, when you see that happen there where people move fast in a particular business, there's typically something, you know, that they laid the groundwork for, for, you know, maybe even several years before that, you know, overnight success happened. So just wanted to preface that and make sure everybody was clear, but yeah, it's really, uh, it's really cool Shecky to be on the uh, other side of the mic here and kind of just share our, our journey and story and really hope to, uh, convey some, some, great lessons for our listeners and how they can scale their portfolio, you know, faster than what maybe they thought was, was even possible. Yeah, that's awesome. And I, I appreciate you saying that it's an interesting concept about, you know, dues paying, you know, obviously with the internet and everything being very sensationalized, oftentimes, you know, you read about these overnight successes and you don't realize some of the planning and some of the, you know, skill sets that were mastered previously. Uh, but, you know, I, I guess I'm kind of curious more on a personal level. I mean, I believe that in order for you to have achieved what you've done, there had to be some sort of personal motivation behind this. I mean, people just don't jump from well, a portfolio of two to a portfolio of 73 doors without having some kind of driver going on behind that. I mean, you know, like I know you're a family man and, and a I'm just kind of curious, you know, like, what is it that drives you to, to move at that kind of pace and create this kind of wealth? <laughs> it's one word, frustration. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how so? Well, you know, to kind of lay the groundwork, everything, as far as the mindset, it all occurred back in 2000 when I read the book Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. That changed my entire mindset, converting me from thinking about you know, capital gains and buying something and praying that it goes up like most people do with their, you know, stock portfolios where you have very little control. In that book, it just completely shifted, you know, my entire consciousness of why you really want to be a real estate investor. So I'm sure most of our listeners have read that book, but I really recommend uh, if you haven't, you know, to get that right away because that's going to set your mind up to be able to, you know, really follow this this kind of path. So when I read the book, 
you know, the concepts there, buying uh, an asset versus a liability and building up a business and then taking that excess cash flow from your business, converting it into real estate so that you could create additional streams of passive income. You know, that was, uh, I, I got that. I understood that. And I love all things passive income. My primary business um, in the nutrition field that I've done the last 20 years, you know, that's all about creating passive income. So, but really, I mean, the biggest why, you know, why did I really want to go after, you know, building the real estate is that I love passive income. I wanted to create, you know, additional streams of it so that I could be t completely present dad. My kids are seven and nine, and they're at this stage where I want to have complete financial security. I want a wall of financial independence around our family so that I can always go to their ball games. You know, they got soccer and baseball every night. And, you know, we want to take family trips together. And we want to just enjoy this journey together as a family. But in order to really fully do all the things that you really want to do, I mean, you really in today's day and age, you got to have money. And particularly, you need multiple streams of income. If you're relying on one income stream and that dries up, you're in trouble. And so I, I, that's the biggest, I think that's the biggest thing, but there were two really, um, beyond that, there were two key events, Shecky, that really kind of pushed me to really make a shift because I was really still heavily involved with stocks up until about two years ago. Okay. And my primary business, we were actually, uh, we got attacked um, by a hedge fund manager. He put a huge billion dollar short against our company, which uh, made a lot of, uh, you know, false claims and a lot of allegations. And, and it was the largest financial attack in, in American business history, actually. And so when that happened, now we've weathered that storm and we've come out just fine. But when that happened, you know, it really triggered me to say, wow, like, I've got to get another backup stream of income. I, I, I know that this is stable. I believe that this business is going to be here for my children and, you know, grandchildren and so on. But it's foolish of me to rely my entire financial future on one stream of income. So, so that really, like, really hit home with me when that happened. And then the second thing is my stocks dropped like a rock, like overnight. One, uh, I had a lot of oil stock and when oil collapsed, um, the pricing collapsed, my stocks dropped something like, you know, $50,000 overnight. And, uh, you know, at that time, that was, you know, that was a chunk of my portfolio. So I yeah. thought, wow, like that, I just cannot live the rest of my life with the whims of the stock market. Like I cannot, I like to be in control. I like growth and stability and predictability. I, I don't like this huge up and down swings. And, you know, let's face it, you're in the stock market, you're going to see over the course of your lifetime, if you're in it for 30, 40 years or more, you're going to see some monster, um, you know, ups and downs. It's just the, it is the cyclical nature of that market. And I always, I tell people all the time, like when they're looking at, you know, the difference, like stocks have a variance of 16, real estate has a variance of four. That means, you know, how much does the price swing from year to year? So if you want something stable and predictable, which is what I like, then real estate is what you need to do. The problem was I just didn't know much about it. So I had to study it. I had to learn it. And Chucky, honestly, all I did was uh, one morning I started, started downloading podcasts on real estate just like this so I could learn the game. And every day in the gym for an hour, I'd devour an hour's worth of podcasts. And then I just keep repeating that. And over the course of 90 days, that was 90 hours of hearing from experts and, and other people that had come before me. And that's really what I learned. And that was only, that was only two years ago from now. And now here we are with our own podcast, Chucky. So people can if they really desire, they can learn it quick and make it, if they just dive in and really, you know, just have a hunger for it. But those were the, um, those are the big reasons. And just kind of a, one last thing along those lines, last week, and this is the power of having a residual passive income from real estate. You know, I called on my mom and, and she always, of course, tells me I, I don't call her enough. So well, that's what moms are supposed to do, right? My mom does the same thing. Right. <laughs> like the phone works both ways. You, well, I don't want to 
bother you, you know, how that goes. But I called her up and I said, Mom, I said, you know what, I got a, I got a question for you. And I said, how about, how would you and dad like to go on a week long Caribbean cruise with our family? We'll pay for it all. And you guys can come with, you know, hang out with us and the kids and, and we'll, we'll take care of you. And, and how would you like to do that in December? And, and she was like shocked. And, uh, she, she, you know, asked my dad if he wanted to do it. And, you know, within 30 seconds, he said, yes. And he didn't yeah. have to think about it. And, so they're just so excited and that's the, you know, they're, they're getting, they're in their seventies now, like how much longer, you know, how much longer are they going to be healthy and around, right? I want to take advantage of the time we have together now and to do that and have really have something cool, like a cool trip like that, that I can financially take care of and not even blink an eye. I don't have to worry about it. My rents are coming in. They're going to more than cover everybody. That's the power of real estate investing is to give you a lifestyle and it's not just about owning doors to owning doors. I think it's to be able to do things and live your, your life the way you really, really ultimately want to live it and enjoy it. Yeah, I think that's, that's awesome. And I, I relate to a lot of that. I mean, I know you're a family guy and I, you know, I've, I've met your family and your, you know, your boys are great and, you know, just being able to see them and hang out and play with them and, you know, and I, I love doing stuff for my mom too. And so I totally get it. I, I think of all the things that I've sort of been observing and watching you do, uh, probably the one that I got the most envious about for, for lack of a better word, uh, is watching you at a moment's notice, hop on a train and go into a world series game. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that one didn't end the way uh, I would, I would hope for a game five clincher of uh, Cleveland Indians versus the Cubs. But uh, uh, anyways, I know that that made you happy. Uh, so I'm, you know, so happy for you, but um, that was pretty, that was a last minute decision. Woke up Sunday morning and checked the uh, pricing came more in line <laughs> uh, with what was reasonable, but still, you know, f four row, five rows back from behind, you know, first base and Wrigley field. It was pretty saucy, and I didn't. Yeah. To, I didn't have to think about it. Uh, my my rentals just automatically covered that ticket, and it wasn't even a big deal. It wasn't even a thought. Yeah. So it, it, this is just again. It just speaks to like you use that word lifestyle, and I think that's great. Um, in and within that, you know, you talk about we talked about motivation, we talked about lifestyle, we talked about preparation. You know, and all that stuff is great, but at the end of the day all that knowledge still has to be applied. So I want to pick your brain a little bit because you had this just incredible like multi-pronged approach to what you did and you you employed so many different strategies and I I want I really want the listeners I want to take the listeners through each one of these one by one and just give a you know a quick explanation of how you were able to pull this off, right? So I know you started, you know, you had some cash flow, obviously, from your current business, and you had a little bit of savings. So how, that's kind of how you started, isn't that right? Yes, exactly. You know, I when I read that book many, many years ago, I just wasn't in a financial position to start investing, um, you know, and and that's okay. I tell people all the time, you know what, maybe this isn't the right time for you to get into real estate. You You may need to you know, you may need to, to bank up some more cash. I mean, of course, that's ultimately up to them and, and so forth. I don't always know their entire situation, but I, I wasn't in a position then, you know? And so I had, to, I had to really get smart with my money and bank cash and increase my income so that I was able to uh, come with more cash to the table to be able to buy. So right. yeah, that was the first strategy, Shecky, is savings, uh, cash savings and, and cash flow. But so that, that was able to get you into your first couple of properties. Didn't you ultimately sell those? So we actually, uh, I sold a, our secondary home. Um, we, when we moved into our now, you know, final home, I believe, and our dream home, we still had our secondary home um, as a rental. So then we, uh, we sold that and captured, you know, probably the, you know, 80,000 in equity there. 
Cool. We used that, which wasn't really making us much money. It was just kind of paying down the debt, you know, from the rent there. It was just, it was a very low CapEx. Of course, that's what you're going to get. That was an A-class home and there was no, there was no, uh, the cap rate was probably three or 4%. Um, yeah. and, and so, you know, that's, that's, that's all those pretty much work. Right? <laughs> but we sold that and captured the equity so then we could put that to work buying up higher yielding C-class property, you know, in Indianapolis. And that, that 80,000 that was sitting there in that home now was put to work and now, you know, making far more income, you know, in Indianapolis with these properties than, you know, just sitting there in that A-class property. Yeah, an interesting side note with that too is, you know, obviously we talk to a lot of investors and, uh, you know, that seems to be a common argument is, you know, do you want to be in those pretty A and B, you know, everybody wants those warm fuzzies of seeing the pretty pictures and the nicely manicured lawns and things like that. And that's great. And at times, obviously, there can be opportunity for appreciation. But the reality is, they're not going to perform nearly as well as, you know, a C class property that you can buy for so much less money, because the the price to rent ratios are just so vastly different. So, you know, again, we could, we have had and can continue to do podcasts just about that. But I, I, I guess I want to commend you for recognizing that because a lot of people are just like, no, you know, I'm good. The, you know, they, they get into this mindset that's like, well, my renters are paying down my mortgage. Cool. Right. Like I'm not, I'm not paying for the house. Somebody else is. And that's great. That's a good starting point. But you really took this to heart and said, no, I'm going to make my money work hard for me. I'm not going to let my money work not so hard or be lazy for me. So I, I just kind of want to make that point and, and throw those, those kudos out to you for really making that shift. Well, one important note there, Shaq, yeah, that's certainly a great point, is that was a, you know, a $300,000 you know, A-class property, right? Yeah. So when we bought that in uh, 2008, the market then was probably about as saucy as it was, you know, right now. Yeah. That property dropped down 40,000 in, in, you know, value within a few handful of months from when we bought it. Mm. So, you know, everybody always thinks, I guess, I don't know, like just like stocks, they think they buy, a, you know, an A class or B class that's always going to go up. Well, if you're buying that property and, and that type of property class and you're just buying it based on not on the cash flow yield, but on the fact that you think it's going to appreciate, you know, I don't know about that strategy, Shecky, especially right now with where the market is. That That's to me is just buy, hold, and pray. I, I want to buy, hold, and know. Yeah. Good point, man. I really appreciate the way you said that. Um, so let's let's continue on this little journey of yours, right? So now at this point, you've got some properties that are working for you, but then you also employed further leverage. Didn't you not refinance a couple of those at that point to be able to leverage into more property? Yeah, exactly. I had uh, two solid B-class properties, uh, one in Arizona and then one here in my hometown in St. Joe, Michigan. And um, so I, I just cashed out, refinanced those properties. One I had debt on and, and another was I was in all cash. So I pulled out, you know, um, quite a bit of equity out of those two properties. And that, that worked great. I mean, that, that freed up a lot of cash that again, now I can use other people's money that I'm borrowing at you know, four, maybe 5%. I don't even know what the interest rate, but it wasn't much. And I'm borrowing that money and now I'm putting it to work, making, you know, 15, 20%. So yeah, that, uh, that was the uh, kind of the next stage. So that just freed up even more cash as well. Yeah, that's great. And so once, then once you had that in place, then you got into like, you were just like leaving no stone unturned. Didn't you do some stuff out of your retirement account? Yeah, so what most people don't realize is that you can actually purchase real estate out of your IRA or 401k. 
Now, I'm going to put a big, you know, preface, a big but there. You have to have it set up with the appropriate plan documents. It's got to be a self-directed or solo, you know, uh, type of plan to where you have that ability in there to purchase real estate. You know, a lot of your traditional brokerage accounts don't allow you based on their plan documents, plan guidelines that allow you to invest into real estate. But it definitely can be done. You just have to set up a new plan document. You know, we've got a, a great, uh, you know, lawyer that does it for what, 800 bucks, I think, sets you up with a whole new plan, gives you checkbook control. So I set the plan up with him. And then, you know, I, I now am able to purchase property out of that account. But there was one step before that, you know, I, in my brokerage account, my 401k account that had all the, you know, stock with uh, holdings. I had to sell all those stocks. I liquidated them all. And I transferred all that cash then into the new self-directed 401k. And then from there, you know, I was able to buy, a, I bought a, a quad, I bought a single family home. I bought a, um, you know, I bought another single family home. So, you know, two singles in a, in a quad in that uh, entity. And yeah. Nine, what the stats are like 97% of all retirement monies are tied up in the you know, stock market or tied up in really, I should say, in assets other than real estate. So there's a huge opportunity for our listeners to put you know, some of their uh, retirement money to work more effectively into that you know, type of plan. Yeah, I think that's great. And I, and I think you know, just to add to that big asterisk that you were trying to do. If you, the listener, are going out there now to just talk to your, uh, you know, IRA person or financial planner to say, hey, I want to do a self-directed, they, it's possible that they may not even understand those words uh, because they're not trained or well-versed in that stuff. And there's only a handful of companies in the United States that actually handle those kinds of transactions. So don't be surprised if the people that you deal with say, well, yeah, you know, you can self-direct. We can either put into this, uh, you know, micro fund or we can, you know, we can put into this mutual fund um, or this bond group, but that's it, you know, because that all they're doing is just selling kind of the retail stuff that they have to sell. And then of course, they're also taking a, a fee for that quote unquote, advice, right, or management of your funds. And by the time you get done with the not so great returns, and then the fees that are involved in that money management, uh, you know, your retirement account, in, in many cases, and we've seen this because we've talked to a lot of investors, is struggling to keep up even with the rate of inflation. So, you know, look, you've worked hard for that money that you put in there. One of the things, again, you want to do is don't let that money be lazy. The beauty of that situation of investing out of a self-directed IRA or 401k is that it's a non-taxable event. So whether it's a you know, regular IRA or a Roth or whatever it is, the tax consequences are exactly the same. The only difference that we're talking about here is that your money is being invested in income producing real estate versus some other stock or other normal funding instrument. So, you know, if you want more information, you can certainly reach out to us and we have some resources that, you know, we can share with you. It, it's not a problem, but one yes, of the things- Chucky, I, yeah. I completely agree. And my broker did not know what a self-directed account was. He had no idea. And he's, I mean, he's great. He's, he's always got my back. I've, you know, certainly um, feel like he's very integrous, but he just didn't know what it was. Most of them, I agree. Um, I, I guess I can't say most, but there's a, there's a good chance that your broker won't know what it is and know how to help you. Yeah, shoot yeah. us a message and, you know, check. I think our next podcast, we got to get Tim on the line and talk about the self-directed uh, 401k. I think it's just too important to our listeners. Yeah, absolutely. Good for you for recognizing that there was some money there that, again, wasn't working as well for you as it could have, but um, but let's move on, right? So then, then you wanted even more properties, and you started going, well, heck, I think I've got some some equity in my house, and you you found a way to take some money out of the equity in your house to buy more property. 
Yeah, this is probably my favorite one out of out of all of them, Shecky, I think. I mean, besides, you know, I, I think it's I like this one better than, you know, cash savings because you're <laughs> you're uh, you're tapping into, you know, unused um, equity in your house. So it's a HELOC, home equity line of credit. And uh, these are fantastic because they they get approved really fast. So you, you know, about 30 days it took me to get this approved. They have to do an appraisal on your property. And this is, and I, from what I understand from going through the process, I could only do this on my primary residence that I've lived in. Um, I mean, it could vary by state or by lender, but as far, that's as far as I know. So we did in our primary, you know, we had equity in our, in our, in our house. I mean, you know, not a, not a ton, but, Quite a bit. Um, so we uh, got an appraisal, went through this process, and you know pulled out a you know good one hundred fifty thousand dollars just sitting there that was not really being utilized. So it's an interest only uh, loan, and it's a line of credit. So you can pay it off at any time. You can pull it back out at any time. It's very flexible in nature, and that's what I really like about it. So. It, you know, you can uh, you can use the HELOC to get some. It's like once it approves, that's cash deposited into your bank account off that line of credit, and then you can buy properties in cash, get better deals, and then if you you know want to finance that property into more long term financing, you can always you know you can always do that and then pay that HELOC back off. So, or just let it ride and then use that cash again to buy more property is what I did. But that's, it's a, it's a fantastic strategy. It does, um, you know, the, the interest rate is, is variable. So it's going to adjust according to the market rate. So I know that my interest rate has gone up a little bit since I initially pulled it, but uh, nothing, uh, you know, nothing too outlandish. So are certainly more than paying for, for that, um, that leverage. Yeah, but it's it's what I love was what you mentioned about the flexibility. I mean, that's just, you know, just to be able to push in and pull out as you need. That's really, really awesome. Yeah, that's my favorite part about it is that, you know, like in a traditional mortgage, let's say, you know, I've got a $100,000 mortgage and I pay off 20 because I want to pay my mortgage down faster to save on the interest. Well, that that money you can't get back out very easily. I mean, you have to do a cash out. You have to do another refinance to get that money back out. It's, it is not easy to get that back out. So with a HELOC, um, you know, like I said, in, out, very quick. It's, it's such a great way for our listeners to um, be able to get a hold of some additional cash to be able to get their, their real estate game going. Yeah, awesome. And then, you know, perfect segue, but you you just started talking about it too. And I know this was really the next strategy at that point you had a few properties built up and you w- then went to a bank and asked to do a cash out refi on a whole package didn't you With, t- tell us about that yeah so that was always the plan was to you know bundle the properties into one you know longer term loan you know with with bank money so i had a purchased 15 units. That was my, my first 15 units in Indy. And I wanted to then, you know, get that cash back out and then, you know, buy some more and use leverage against those 15 units. So that's where you do a, uh, it's called a co- commercial or portfolio loan. And that's where you're bundling properties all together under one loan. In my opinion, it really only makes sense to do it, you know, when you've got at least three properties, four, four probably or more, um, you're, you're saving on the closing costs and appraisals, and then you're just putting them into one easy, you know, all together, one loan payment. And it's just kind of makes things more streamlined. Now, the only, uh, uh, and the nice thing too, Shek, is that, you know, if you get a good appraisal, and appraisals guys can vary, you know, quite a bit. So sometimes it's like Russian roulette. You never know what bullets in the chamber. So I know, you know, want to caution our listeners on their expectations. My appraisals were done well. They were based on the income approach. You know, they didn't use comps. So based on the cap rates or income approach of these properties, which are very high yielding, 
I was able to get uh, very, very good appraisals. In fact, um, we came in over a hundred thousand, you know, for those 15 units over what I put in in cash. So then I was able to pull all my cash back out plus then some more because um, I was able to pull out 80% of the you know appraised value back out. And now I have that bundled in a loan. I just, the, every month the rent checks just more than, more than cover that loan payment. I mean, it's not even close. So that allowed me to free up that additional cash to then go out and buy more properties. And I'm making, I figured it out. I'm making infinite return on those fifth, first 15 units, Jackie. That's, that's pretty cool. I mean, because I have zero of my own money, or zero of my own cash into those properties now. So yeah. I'm, I'm uh, pretty ecstatic about infinite returns. I love that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that sounds great. And, and here's the other thing, even, even if you, I mean, obviously playing with language is great, but and even if we don't do that, you know, just to think about, you know, servicing that debt and being in an extremely positive situation because you invested in high yielding properties. In other words, you, you weren't, again, going back to the earlier conversation, you weren't necessarily so concerned about pretty, you were more concerned about what the dollars looked like. And because the, you were buying into properties that had such strong cash flow, you now were, are able to service the debt on, the, on that cash out refi loan as a package, more than enough, plenty of positive passive cash flow every month, and freeing up a whole bunch of cash to buy a bunch more properties which also create a bunch more cash flow. I mean, it's like the perfect situation. That's exactly right. Yeah, that's awesome. So let's move on because I know you did one thing that often makes people very nervous. And that is the principle of OPM, other people's money. But you did do just a bang up job of getting private investor funding uh, for some of your projects, you know, can you walk us through a little bit what you did, what you said, how it kind of came to be and, and how you put that together? Well, you know, here's the thing I, I think the listeners need to understand is that this goes back to, you know, a rich dad, poor dad quote, or it was one, one of those books that he wrote, Robert Kiyosaki said, the, uh, the rich build networks, everyone else looks for work. So within, you know, my network are some people that are pretty well off. And, you know, that, that's uh, very, very, I think that's very important. <laughs> yeah. There's always going to be times if you're an entrepreneur throughout your career that, you know, going to other people to leverage through their capital uh, will make sense. And so uh, it just happened to uh, my landlords at uh, where we have our nutrition club. They, um, you know, I knew that they had just put a significant amount of capital into purchasing our, our building. So we were sitting down having lunch, talking about my, um, you know, our, our current lease situation of renewing. And I just kind of started pitching them on it and said, you know, basically, I can't remember exactly how the conversation went, but that, you know, I told them about the venture and that I could get them a nice solid return, solid return on their money every month and very low risk and I personally guarantee it. And, um, you know, we set up a, a whole LLC and a whole business kind of partnership. So they fund, they've provided additional funding for me to be able to buy more properties. And, you know, we have a, a one year term and, you know, then I have the option to renew it here coming up in a few months. And, you know, more than likely will. It's, you know, one thing you got to know about private lending is that, you know, it definitely can be, you're going to pay a higher interest rate. You're not paying four or 5%, you know, for private money. That's not going to, typically that's not going to entice another investor to, you know, to be able to take the risk and lend you money. So you have to know that you're probably going to be 10, 12, or maybe more to be able to entice them to do it. So if you're going to do that, you know, you've got to make sure that it makes sense for you where you have plenty of rental income coming in every month to be able to offset those payments that you're making to the private money or that you know that you're just doing it on a shorter term basis so that you can, you know, acquire some properties and then 
your plan would be eventually to refinance it into longer term, lower interest rate lending. So those are the situations where it probably makes a, a lot more sense, you know, for our listeners to do it where they're, it's more short term type acquisition money to then refinance into longer term, you know, money later on. Right. But I, I want to just add one asterisk, what you said, because you, you kind of glossed over it and it's something that I feel is often missed. Right. And so when you said, Hey, I was sat down to lunch with them. I just started pitching them. Well, pitching is a, is an interesting word. Um, it's like you're serving up something, but I believe that the reason that you were successful or the reason that any investor is successful in securing private money is because they posture the situation in such a way that's highly beneficial for the pitchy or for the batter in this case, to use your baseball analogy. So whether they're your landlords in another business or whether it's your rich uncle or whatever the situation is, when you go to somebody and you can show them, look, here's what you may be getting on your money now, here's what you could be getting, and we're in this as a partnership, I'm gonna be buying high income producing properties where I can easily make this payment so your risk is very low, you're showing them that you're putting them in a position where not only can they get good returns, but they have a high amount of safety. And so I think that that needs to be said because it's just, otherwise it's just like, you know, if you go to your rich uncle and go, you know, hey, um, can, can I borrow 150K? You know, it's like, well, they automatically go on the defensive and like, what's in it for them? So no, that's, a, that's a great point, Shecky. And, you know, when I, you know, think back to when, you know, I, I pitched you on, you know, being my business partner in this venture, right? Yeah. One thing that I remember that you that stood out that you said as, as far as why you were interested is that I framed it in a way to where it was in, you know, very much your, like you had a lot to benefit. You had a lot to gain from partnering with me. It wasn't the traditional pitch that you got from so many people before that was more like, well, come, you know, you sell my stuff and, you know, kind of more one-sided type transaction. This, and that's, so you made a great point. Just kind of, that kind of just kind of came up in my mind of you always got to frame it as you're, when you're presenting something to somebody else, you got to think what is in it for them and what could motivate them to want to, you know, to act you know, what yeah. that's going to, cause everybody always wants to know what's in it for me. Yeah. What's in it for me? Always. That's always yeah. the question they're going to ask. I'm reminded of the old, uh, Zig Ziglar, may he rest in peace. But, uh, you know, and he, you know, he did so many famous motivational talks, but, but one of his little favorite sayings is, Hey, what's people's fa favorite radio station? Well, it's W I I F M what's in it for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, and it's, it's just the way it works. I mean, yeah. we, human beings are wired to be selfish. That's I don't true. mean that in a negative way. It's just the way we're wired. Sure. So accept that, address it and use that to your advantage. Right. Um, but always, but yes, Jack, you did a great job in in posturing that in such a way that it, it proved to be highly beneficial to me. And here we are. So, um, moving on, I want to think and want to also address some things that other people oftentimes don't consider, and that's really their own discipline when it comes to money. You know, we, we talk about real estate, we talk about getting rich and, you know, driving the fancy cars and, you know, we throw that word lifestyle around like crazy. But, you know, even as a guy who, you know, was doing pretty well and has very successful other business, um, I, I have a lot of respect for you for the way that you managed your own regular monthly finances. And I, I wanted you to speak to that a little bit about how you were able to leverage that discipline to be able to get, get even more properties and build an even bigger portfolio. Sure. So, I mean, you got to look at, you know, there's two things, you know, there's playing offense and there's playing defense with your money. 
and you look at the philosophies that are out there, you know, there, there's like some of them that are, you know, like you look at Grant Cardone, increase your income, make more money. You know, that's, that's an offensive philosophy. And then you got the Dave Ramsey's and the Susie Ormans that are, you know, pay down debt, save your money, you know, decrease expenses. And that's a very defensive philosophy. Yeah. And now the argument is, which one is better? Well, they're both right. And I've taken both philosophies and just combined it together. And so I've always taken on the, um, and with moderation too, you know, I want to, I want to live as I'm, you know, I want to live as I'm good lifestyles. I'm moving along. I don't want to, you know, be, be too uh, bare bones, but um, you know, we really tried to watch our, our, a lot of our major expenses. You know, you look at your, what are your major expenses? You know, typically your house, um, and your uh, car and your taxes. Those are your three, most likely your three biggest, you know, expenses that you have some control over. So, you know, we lived in a, in a house that, uh, and I alluded to it, where we could have bought a lot bigger house at the time. Our income ju certainly justified us being able to buy a much bigger uh, house. And uh, yet we just stayed put for, for several years to keep banking cash. You know, I, I had a car that up until a few months ago had 130,000 miles on it. It was a 2007, you know, Mercedes Benz. I mean, it wasn't a junker, but, you know, it was a pretty 10-year-old, uh, you know, used car with a lot of miles on it, but no payment. So I was banking lots of cash by, you know, having that car. And then taxes. You know, I work really, really hard um, to learn, you know, different ways that I can and work with professionals to reduce the biggest liability that I have, which is my taxes. So with those three things, you know, under control, check, I was able to save, I was able to play defense with my money and save and bank a lot of cash. And then also at the same time, I went on the offense and worked really, really hard. A lot of times, you know, 12 hour days to increase my income so that I was able to you know, be able to uh, bank more cash, right? So I want to increase the spread of my money. The difference between, you know, monthly expenses and, you know, monthly income is the spread of which you're able to then, you know, save. So I really worked hard on that. And, you know, that's what created a lot of the initial, you know, capital that, that's been able to, you know, been deployed into these properties to get, to get the whole ball rolling. Yeah, it's awesome. I, I got to tell you, I love the description of the, the combination of offense and defense because, man, it's so, it's, you're so right on with that. Like, you know, when you, you look at the, the Dave Ramseys of the world and everything is just, just complete defense, you know, reduce all your expenses. And then you got the, the complete offense on the other side. And, and I, I like that you're focusing really on the majors. You know, in other words, you know, home cars and taxes. Uh, because so much of that other discussion is about stuff that affects you by $5 a month. And right. you know, it's just not, you know, you have to, it's almost like, you know, like they tell you when you get married, you know, choose your battles, right? Well, this is really a great lesson in choosing the right battles and to say, Hey man, this is, let's focus on the stuff that's going to matter. Right. And I just, I just think that's, that's brilliant. Yeah. You know, you know, one, there's, there's other things that we did, right? But I think you're, you hit it. It's the major things. You know, we, uh, you know, I know Dave Ramsey says, don't, you shouldn't see the inside of a restaurant, you know, if you're, you're trying to, you know, save money. Well, okay. I mean, that's, to me, that's a bit extreme. Uh, we cook at home most of the time, but there's occasional couple times a month, we'll go out to a restaurant and, you know, there, there's, so there's things that we, we try to be moderate in the approach of not, being so severe with our restrictions that you know that we're miserable <laughs> but we want to enjoy our journey this whole journey uh but there's definitely you know and I, let me tell you this shecky we just uh yesterday i just uh i closed on a um you know deal on a new brand new tesla it's like probably 100 i think it cost me one hundred five thousand. sweet and um, I wanted the one that self drives. You know, yeah. I, I really wanted to be able to text uh, while well, I'm going down the highway to you know Indianapolis. You know? Yeah. <laughs> be able to text and Facebook or whatever. So um, I really wanted to upgrade. So 
we got that, but I'm not any happier by any stretch in that car than I than I was in the Benz. I mean, you know, there's there's just no there's no difference in happiness. Yes, do I enjoy the car? Of course, you know, it's it's great, but it's not it's not going to do it. What really makes me happy is being able to call up mom and say, "Let's go on a cruise, mom," because we were financially responsible with our money and we played it smart and we invested into real estate. So we have passive income. That's what makes me happy. Taking my kids this, you know, Wednesday to Disney, you know, that makes me, that makes me really happy. You know, that's uh, you know, they, they say money doesn't buy happiness, but it buys you jet skis. And have you ever <laughs> seen anybody unhappy on a jet ski? Yeah. I've well, never seen anybody frowning on a jet ski. Right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so I, um, and we got a jet ski, right? And we got one of those. And it, and it does make me happy for the, you know, three days a year that we get to use it, right? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's really all about, to me, it's about the experiences that you can then do. And that's what I think is, is really what this whole game, to me, is all about, is increasing the quality of the experiences that I get to have with, you know, my friends and my family. That's to me is, is why you play offense and why you play defense at the same time. Yeah, well said. And, and we could do a whole other podcast on that, but um, every bit of study that's ever been done about happiness and brain waves and, uh, you know, all those stats of whether somebody's, you know, using uh, antidepressants or not using them or whatever, but it all, always boils down to one thing in that experiences – are always going to bring more happiness than things. So, you know, that kind of passive income can buy both. It can buy experiences and it can buy things, right? Yes. But, but having the time, passive income creates a situation where you have the time to enjoy those experiences, to really, you know, develop family relationships further and deeper. And so I, I, I just love Love what you're up to, man. It's just just awesome. Yeah, one and just one more thing hit me there. You know, speaking of the greats, Brian Tracy said, and this is the one thing that out of all his audio tips just always resonates with me. He said, 85% of your happiness in your life is due to the quality of your relationships with other human beings. Yeah. 85%. That's a pretty monstrous, you know, number. And he didn't, he didn't say that it had to do with things in your life. It had to do with relationships with other people. And so, you know, everything has polarity, right? There's, everything has its opposite. So conversely, 85% of your misery in life comes from your relationships, <laughs> lack thereof, with other yeah. human beings. Yeah. So I want to make sure that I have, you know, making good money is important to me but also having the time to enjoy it with my family and with my friends. That's what's really important to me. So, you know, that, that's, that's what, again, that, that all comes down to joy and happiness. That's what this whole thing is. I mean, 73 units. Wow. Great. You know, that's 73, you know, or 40 properties, right? 73 doors. It's, 40 tax bills, you know, that have to be, you know, taken care of by somebody, right? <laughs> by me or yeah. somebody I hire. So that's, yeah. that's, that's all great on paper, but why, you know, why do it? Why do right. it? That's what everybody's got to get clear on is why they're doing this so that they then have the energy and the drive to uh, figure it out because there, there are simply no limits to resources. There's only limits to resourcefulness and uh, they can ever all of our listeners can take any number of these steps as well and and get out there and get resourceful and figure it out how to make it happen and yeah you that said i i think you told me that you know one of the ways that you were resourceful was you figured out how to get some discount on some of these properties how did you how were you able to pull that off oh that's a great one Shashi. great glad you asked so when I first got going, you know, I was very, uh, very happy with the, um, you know, with the whole system and, and, and our provider and the properties and the returns. And I just loved everything about it, their integrity and ethics and how they, you know, took care of me. And so, you know, I was excited finally to find something that 
produced high returns consistently. But this is just is like, wow, this is a dream come true as an investor. So I started, you know, made a deal and I sent them referrals. And, and so then by sending referrals of other investors, it's essentially I'm doing the selling for, you know, the provider, right, of the, the properties. Well, there's a lot of value there. You know, that's a, that's, there's a lot of value in drumming up investor capital and, and whatnot. So when I sent those investors, uh, because I was a happy, satisfied client, then they started buying and then, you know, they started giving me discounts, very nice discounts off of my, uh, my own, you know, property purchases. So, I mean, okay. I, I think I earned a, I earned a duplex or something like that for free almost it's just based Jeez. on how many I sent. That's so sweet. Yeah. And so that, um, but it, it ended up being like a, you know, just a discount off every property that I purchased and, and then it just helped me buy more, you know, faster. So um, I, and my buddy, uh, and I've got the same deal going for, for our clients too. You know, my buddy Larry has drummed up so many clients. I think he's, He's basically got a duplex almost for free, not quite, but pretty darn close. And, um, you know, that's, uh, but that's, that's a lot of referrals guys. So just so you know, I mean, that wasn't like two, that was several, but that, um, that is something very uh, important to uh, consider is that, you know, you can leverage off your own network. And then, you know, what happened, Shecky is all these referrals were being, you know, were sent in and they started buying, and they were happy. And that was, the point of which I realized I had a business on my hands. I had another, you know, I had another business almost by accident. Um, you know, that was, you know, what year ago, May. And then uh, June is when I connected with you and said, dude, I need help, you know, to, to scale and grow this. I need your expertise. So that um, that's pretty much how it kind of, how it flowed is started off as a happy, satisfied investor, which, I am always first. I'm an investor first. You know, I sell properties, you know, you know, secondary, but that's um, kind of like just the, the, the basics of what they can do to generate uh, additional, you know, uh, discounts off their own and, and, and grow faster. Yeah. So I want to, uh, if you don't mind, I'm, I know we're going to run short on time here, but I, I want to just, I've been making some notes as we've spoken and um I want to just review all the, cause it's just amazing. I want to review all the different strategies that you employ, right? So for the listeners who've been really following, there were actually nine of them, right? So I'm going to just run through these real quick. I'm just reading off my handwriting right here. <laughs> you know, and so we did this, I had no idea that we, there were nine. I just, I just yeah. got after it, you know? And so for, for, for you guys and girls that are sitting out there, you know, in listener land and going, well, gosh, you know, how am I going to generate money? How am I going to, how am I going to buy stuff? You know, I don't, I don't have a hundred K sitting in my bank account right this second. Just listen to this list, right? So number one, cash flow from current biz and savings. Number two, sold other properties. Number three, refinanced properties. Number four, invested out of a self-directed IRA. Number five, home equity line of credit. Number six, cash out refi as a package. Number seven, where's my number? Number seven, private lenders. Number eight, smart money management, a combination of offense and defense. And number nine, getting discounts via referrals. Right, like yeah. that's a lot of stuff. Yeah. Good yeah you. you know what? I'm on number ten right now too, with which hasn't uh you know hasn't closed yet. But we're getting the zero uh, percent interest lines of credit off the uh, credit card offers. Yeah, that's a whole nother podcast. But yeah, yeah there's some cool stuff going on. Yeah, there. exactly. When we have more, we'll uh, we'll share it with so, our listeners. So let's wrap up just by talking about two things. Like you know, I want to know like basically. Uh, you know, a rough picture just for our listeners, what's going on right now? So, you know, you, you said basically about 40 properties, about 73 doors. What does that equal to in approximate numbers from a standpoint of, you know, like assuming they all are rented, what, you know, what's the gross rent? What's your expenses against that kind of stuff? Yeah. So, uh, Shecky, um, 
it's definitely a moving number simply because there's constantly, you know, I'm buying properties and, and rehabbing properties and then they get to, you know, performing status. So, so several of these, a chunk of them are being rehabbed, um, you know, as we speak. So right. let's, let's operate under the assumption that they're all, you know, rehabbed and, and they're all performing, which is not too far away. Right. So out of that, it'll generate right around 43,000 a month in rent. So an average of about 600, you know, I've got, you know, I got some B class that are hitting 1500 and I got some, you know, some that, uh, and very few of those, by the way, um, but most of them are right around the, you know, 550 to, to 750 type range. So yeah, right around an average of say 600 it, and I'm being conservative with that as well. So then um, with that uh, expense wise, um, you know, we figured uh, about 6,000 to service the debt on, you know, there's, mul there's the portfolio loan and then there's uh, what, two or three other individual uh, loans on certain properties. And then about 3K a month in taxes and the taxes are very low in Indianapolis. So that's, that's awesome. And then, uh, and that actually could be a little bit higher. So let's say 4K on that. And then, um, 8k for you know factoring a, a high 10 percent vacancy and uh, you know and repairs but most of these have been rehab so repairs have been almost zero to they've been nil pretty much so i know eventually that that that's going to kick in and there's going to be you know 10 of turnover costs and and such so we'll, we're factoring in even though it's first year we're not seeing anything um so that's 18k in expenses, so 43 minus 18, 25K a month in net cash flow. Cool. Um, and most of these, by the way, too, uh, I didn't put insurance down because the huge bulk of this portfolio is, is what we call self-insured. <laughs> so, um, you know, if you factored in insurance, you know, you certainly would, that would deduct off the, uh, you know, 25 K a month, but that's about, you know, 20, 25 K a month and net cash flow that's coming in, uh, you know, passively every single month. That's, uh, that's pretty good. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. That's so great. So, so the last question is, you know, notwithstanding, you know, our partnership, because we have certain goals and things that we want to achieve growing our company and helping other investors, but I'm, this is an unusual podcast in that I, I get to interview you, Jack, the man, the investor, not my business partner. So that said, right. where, where are you going personally? Like what is this, what is your personal portfolio look like to you if we go a year, two years, five years down the road? Well, the, you know, the goal has always been to get to a hundred doors. I, I don't know why it's just something sounds really cool about hitting a hundred doors. Maybe that's an ego thing. Um, in, in all likelihood, it, it probably is, but uh, or the challenge of it, I should say, right, being, being kind of nicer uh, to myself. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I want to hit 100 doors. And then, you know, I've, I've had in, the goal in mind to hit 500. You know, I don't know, like that's how, how once I hit 100, I don't know how burning that will be based on just all the, um, you know, the management and, and such. And so I guess I need to hit 100 and then, you know, kind of evaluate and, and take it from there. Maybe I want to take on some much bigger, you know, apartment complexes or, or something yeah, like that. Yeah, that was kind of my question. Do you see like, you know, multi-door stuff? And I mean, I know, you know, we've got things pretty automated and, you know, we just collect rent checks every month and, you know, the management company is stellar and, so, I mean, you know, as automated as it can be. But that said, uh, it's the whole, you know, 40, 50, 80 unit, 150 unit thing is, let's just say, intriguing to me. And I'm just wondering if something like that is on your radar. Certainly on the radar. I think that's quite a ways down the road, uh, like, you know, five years, maybe longer it's going to be really hard to uh, beat these kind of returns, I think, and with anything. So I, I, I know that if I do make that kind of jump, I'm probably going to take a sacrifice in ROI, which will be probably hard to make that switch. 
to be able to pull off like a volume move like that. You know, these are some of the best, these are some of the best returns in the country. I've heard that from multiple investors, Shecky. So I'm staying put right here for quite a while. And, uh, you know, I think the next stage if uh, you know, moving past 100 is I'm going to need somebody, you know, an executive assistant or somebody to help, you know, run my portfolio, even though we have great, of course, we have great property management, but still, you know, all the, you know, tax bills and just all the stuff that, that comes along with, you know, tracking, you know, that much with taxes and everything. I need somebody to help me out with that. So um, I think, you know, let's see how that goes. I might, I, might, I definitely might scale even bigger beyond a hundred. Uh, I, I kind of leaving that up, up in the air. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I, I don't really have any other questions, but I, I just really want to say thanks so much for, you know, taking on the different role for this podcast. You know, it's great, I think, for our listeners to see more the personal side of this rather than the, the business side and, you know, really understand someone's personal motivation. And, you know, I mean, I, every day, I got to tell you, dude, I'm, uh, I'm like, I'm following in your, on your coattails, right? Like I'm buying up properties and I'm nowhere near where you are, but, uh, you know, you are definitely, uh, very much an inspiration to me and and I'm certain very much an inspiration to many of the listeners. So I just want to say thanks for, for coming out and letting me interrogate you. <laughs> yeah. I really enjoyed this one, Shecky. Great, uh, great job as the interviewer. You did fantastic. And, you know, listeners go out there and um, establish your why and go out there and build your empire. And you guys can definitely do the same thing that I did and be patient with yourself. You know, again, I, you know, this was, this was years in the making. It did not happen overnight. You know, there were resources I brought to the table as you can, you know, here, you know, I sold some property, refied some property, had some cash savings, had a nice business cash flow income, you know, had a self-directed IRA. I brought things to the table when I first started. So that made it a lot easier to scale that quick. So just, do the best that you can, learn all you can, and, uh, you know, keep listening to our podcast. And I think that, you know, as we keep unfolding here, as we keep putting out, you know, great content for you, you know, we're going to teach you guys how to, uh, to do the same thing and, and, grow a, and grow a really nice portfolio. So, Shaky, with that, thank you, and I appreciate the opportunity here. Yeah, thank you, brother, and thank you, listeners. And uh, we'll, we've got some really interesting stuff up our sleeve. So we will see you on the next show. 